What's good, y'all? It's your boy Ross back at again with another video. So, we're gonna check out 10 legendary WWE feuds that dragged on way too long by none other than Cultaholic Wrestling. I've been subscribed to Cultaholic for many years now, a few years now, actually. So, definitely go subscribe to him uh, if you are interested in uh, just another YouTube wrestling source that's, uh, that's out there. So, definitely go check them out. Um, but yeah, uh, when I think of feuds that just lasted a little bit longer than they should have, the first one that comes to mind, John Cena versus Randy Orton. Did they have some great matches? Classic matches, yes. But we can all agree, well, most of us can agree, they their feud at some point, it was just redundant. I'm like, Jesus, how many times have these guys fought? And the same thing, I can say the same thing with Brock Lesnar and, and uh, Roman Reigns. I'm kind of tired of seeing them go back at it or main event WrestleManias and stuff like that. So there there are those situations where you, this, the feuds can just go in a little bit too long. But nevertheless, it still makes for some great memories and uh, some legendary matches. So let's get into this video. Appreciate all the love and support on the channel. Let's do the damn thing, man. A great feud can, in theory, go on for as long as it bloody well wants to. Because if the formula works and the stars align, then it works. Yeah. I mean, look, we will all watch Stone Cold Steve Austin offer Vince McMahon a beer, only to hit him with a stunner, of or course. a devastating kick to the gut anyway, until the end of time. Because their feud is evergreen, as are a few others in WWE history. The trick is to keep things fresh and yeah. know when to quit, or otherwise know when not to bring back a feud for an unwanted sequel or two. And that is because even legendary feuds between Hall of Fame superstars have their shelf lives. Mm -hmm. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling and these are 10 legendary WWE feuds that dragged on way too long. I Join wonder us. if John Cena and Randy Orton is going to be John Cena versus <laughs> <laughs> There we go. My question was already answered at the beginning of this video. I love John Cena. I love Randy Orton. They've had some great matches, like I said. But their feud got restarted so many times. Like, they would revisit their feud too many times. It got, it kind of got boring. Now, you know, John's doing the movie movie thing, the actor thing. And Randy Orton, uh, before he got injured, was, you know, kind of helping Matt Riddle get over. So, he had his own thing. But, it, ah, bruh. I, I'm 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 good on seeing any more matches from them. They they had some of their best matches. Their story is they don't really have to tell much. To, they don't have to add more to their story. I know some people would love to see one more match with them. Maybe you know one more match, but honestly, I I don't think it's necessary in my personal opinion. This is Randy Orton. In the end, it will be cockroaches, Keith Richards, and Randy Orton and John Cena fighting over who gets to be a record 57-time yep. WWE yep. champion. <laughs> Two of WWE's greatest developmental success stories uh -huh. were always going to play a major part as leaders of the next generation once the Attitude Era heard thinned out, but I'm not sure anyone thought they would be squaring off as recently as 2017. Arriving on the main roster That's within crazy. weeks of each other in 2002, it took Big Match John and the Legend Killer five whole years to have their first proper singles feud. And that's crazy when you think about it. It took them a while before they actually clashed. But when they clash, they just kept clashing. And they just kept clashing. And they just kept clashing. And they just kept clashing. <laughs> They headlined SummerSlam that year, just as they did two years later when WWE booked it again. In between, they feuded on the road to WrestleMania 24, including a match at No Way Out, and then a triple threat, also featuring Triple H at mm -hmm. Mania itself. After 2009, they rested the feud before resurrecting it in 2013 and mm -hmm. 2014. Yep. By then, we had seen them wrestle on practically every event under practically every stipulation, and their matches and segments only served as a stark reminder of WWE's failure to create new stars to this replace is true. them. Number nine, Triple H versus Randy <laughs> Yep, it makes sense. Triple H and Randy Orton. They've had a long, illustrious feud as well. The Orton. Oh, Given Randy Orton man. and Triple H's association via evolution and the student-mentor relationship they had... Actually, I think Triple H's last wrestling match was Randy Orton. Yeah. His actual last in-ring wrestling match, I think it was an overseas show. Correct me if I'm wrong. 
I believe it was Randy Orton. I think that was his last actual wrestling match. And both on screen and off, there was no doubting that when the split inevitably occurred, they would be long-term rivals. Yeah. It happened much quicker than most predicted, with the game betraying the legend killer almost immediately after young Randy won the World Heavyweight title for the first time in the summer of 2004. Hunter took the big gold belt from him a month later, and the two continued to scrap through the 2005 Royal Rumble before Batista nicked Orton's spot on the road to WrestleMania. Mm -hmm. Orton and Helmsley continued feuding as part of the DX vs Rated RKO saga and then resumed their singles rivalry in the autumn of 2007 and then continued to mix it up through the summer of 2008, trading the WWE title yep. as they clashed numerous times on television and pay-per-view. They collided several times more in the first half of 2009, again with the WWE title at stake, including in that bore fest of a WrestleMania yeah, main event before finally boring. packing it in for a while. They brought it back 10 years later at Super a showdown with Orton going over Triple H in Triple H's final televised match. Yep. Number eight, The Undertaker versus Mankind. They definitely Nick had Foley a lot of deserves matches. Deserves a ton too. of credit Woo. for his role in helping to make The Undertaker more interesting when he, as Mankind, made his way to WWE in the spring of 1996. The Dead Man had already established his mythical character by that point, but his feuds and subsequent matches with all manner of freaks and giants had been largely lackluster for a while. But Foley changed all that as he allowed Taker to show a lot more between the ropes than he had done previously. Their bouts throughout the year were entertaining, yes, and they managed to keep things spiced up with crazy stipulations like the Boiler Room Brawl and Buried Alive. Yep. But by the time they met over the Phenom's WWE title at Revenge of the Taker, they had been warring for a solid year off and on, and there was a definite sense that it was time to move on. Which WWE did, to be fair, yep. though they reheated their program in 1998 Ooh. for King of the Ring. Everyone remembers that Hell in a Cell match, yes, but their feud really had very little steam going into it. Number seven, Triple H versus Classic Shawn Michaels. Hell in a Cell match. The feud now, this one, this one, I think this one ended at the perfect time. Granted, for a few years they were going back and forth. Because it was just such an intense blood feud, but I don't think they overdid it. That's just my personal opinion. I think they it, it kind of worked. Maybe, maybe this video will you know show me because I don't remember all their matches, but I don't remember them really just overdoing this feud. Between Triple H and Shawn Michaels I don't know. was a natural one, with the Heartbreak Kid having been supplanted by his DX understudy in the four years that he was retired following a crippling back injury sustained in 1998. Their unsanctioned street fight at SummerSlam 2002 Great. was a stunning epic, and had that been that for their rivalry, it would have been enough. But Michael soon realized his battered back had healed sufficiently for further matches, and in the end, a second run as a full-time in-ring performer. The matches and moments the hunter Sean feud produced were, it's fair to say, a bit of a mixed bag. Their three stages of hell and Hell in a Cell efforts, for example, were overblown forced epics that didn't live up to their main event billing. Their blinder on the last draw of 2003 and last man standing match at the 04 Royal Rumble, on the other hand, were simply fantastic. In the middle was, well, a lot of middling stuff. Fact is, between SummerSlam no. 02 and Taboo Tuesday I don't know if 04, I agree with that, not to mention se. a wild That's just match my on Raw in 06, these two spent way too much time on opposite sides of the ring. Number six, Randy Orton versus Edge. When Randy Orton and Edge first started feuding into- Even with this one, I don't think it was well, I don't know. I don't I don't consider this feud that overdrawn out. I could be wrong. I just I don't know. I don't know. They've had it back and forth off and on, but I, I just don't I don't consider it overblown in my opinion like overdone like the Randy Orton and John Cena 2004 feud. they were two hot young and hungry prospects desperate to break through the glass ceiling when they briefly resumed their feud in 2007 they were just about established in the main events in 2010 they were trusted headliners who were basically in between programs and killing time before moving on to something new and in 2020 they were veteran dads trying to navigate a friggin global pandemic and put on the they greatest wrestling <laughs> great. Match 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 ever. Match match ever. Both men are great they had some fantastic and they had decent matches. chemistry together in the ring, but WWE went to the well one too many times.
lives and revived a rivalry that people didn't exactly go nuts about to begin with. Put simply, when it comes to Edge and Orton, the best thing they've ever done together is not one of their lengthy matches, but the rated RKO tag team. The rivalry between the Viper and the Ultimate Opportunist provided some highlights, such as their IC title cracker at Vengeance 04, but mm -hmm. it's not in the top five of either's career. Number five, this Seth is Rollins understandable. versus Dean Ambrose. This is definitely understandable. Uh, me, personally, I did like their run when they came back to WWE. Well, when Edge came back to WWE, I uh, enjoyed that run. Even though the WrestleMania match they have was a little bit too long or whatnot, but... Their their setup the setup for it was great. I love their interaction. The greatest wrestling match ever. I think that was overblown, but it was still a good match. I enjoyed it for what it was, and I, I don't think they need to do it anymore. I think that's it for them. No more going against each other. Let that go. Rose. The Shield were an unstoppable force for they a long time. They definitely had plenty of matches. The sense that the Hounds of Justice would, like any other stable, go their separate ways eventually. While Roman Reigns was being groomed like the big dog he is for the top spot, the most intriguing feud to come out of the Shield's dissolution was the one between Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose. At least the first time, that is. The yeah. architect and lunatic fringe waged war after Rollins stabbed them in the back, with a chair, not a knife to be fair, and the two had some highly energetic outings Facts. that really helped elevate Ambrose especially yep. in the eyes of the fans. The highlights was probably their Hell in a Cell mm -hmm. main event at the 2014 event of the same name. You could see why WWE would run it back in 2016 and 2018, especially with Dean playing the heel the last time, but we've kind of seen it done to death by then, and WWE's creative wasn't especially complimentary. Number four, Yeah, Dean when they ran it back again as... Dean Ambrose being a heel, it had promise of working, but then it just fell off the rails with the whole Bane mask shit. It just got goofy quickly. They really should have ended it when they first had that go around. Generation X versus the McMahons. All right, we may be stretching the definition of legendary here, but there were three legends and Shane McMahon involved in this one. And it did take up the bulk of what felt like the best part of a decade. But as I look closer at the dates, was actually only about six months. I Damn. say only because half a goddamn year is more than enough time to wrap up a feud. And this one honestly True. felt like it was much longer, probably because it was an offshoot of HBK's feud with Vincent's son, which began at the start of the year. And don't get me wrong, I love a good knob or poop joke as much as the next well-adjusted adult male. But the pranks <laughs> and hijinks that the DX lads pulled off on a weekly basis were perhaps just a tad too much. As for the matches, they were never going to be classics, but the Hell in a Cell blow-off was shockingly brutal and ended with Vince giving Big Show a prostate yeah. <laughs> even if the payoff came when the feud had already played out. Number three. I like when DX were being assholes. I thought that shit was... That shit was funny, bro. When they were just pissing off Vince McMahon, bro, that shit was funny. Me personally, I enjoyed that. That just it was it was funny to me. Bret Hart versus Jerry Lawler. The feud between Bret Hart nah, and this Jerry I don't really Lawler know too much off about. the 1993 King of the Ring when Lawler jealously decked the tournament winner and lasted all the way until the same pay per view two years later when the Hitman made Jerry eat his own foot. What Their the first hell? major match took place at SummerSlam a couple of months in, with the King enlisting the help of an evil Doink the Clown as a roadblock before Lawler quote unquote beat Bret after Hart refused to relinquish the sharpshooter. Their feud might have actually ended at Survivor Series a few months later, but the man from Memphis ran into some legal trouble and was taken off the show. Clearly craving a proper resolution, WWE rebooked the two of them in back-to-back pay-per-views in 1995, with the excellence of execution finally getting that elusive win and finishing things for good. There was some fun stuff in the feud, which simultaneously took place in Lawler's Memphis promotion for a time, and it was always a treat here the announcer make jokes at the expense of Stu and Helen, but it didn't need to be drawn out for as long as it was. Oh, Number two, know that. Roman Reigns versus Brock. I'm glad this is on the fucking list. Set this at the beginning of the video. So glad this is on the list. This needs to be their last match <laughs> at this year's SummerSlam. Please.
Lesnar. <laughs> it takes a special type of rivalry to headline WrestleMania on three separate occasions. Before Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar accomplished the feat in 2022, only The Rock and Steve yep. Austin had put on a trilogy on the grandest stage, mm -hmm. and only two of those matches went on last. Yep. The Beast and Tribal Chief initially locked horns at the granddaddy of them all back in 2015, meaning there was seven whole years between their first and last singles matches at Mania. In the interim, they fought in plenty of multi man matches mm -hmm. and had four other singles bouts, including their WrestleMania 34 chore of a main event. Oh, that Aside was from awful. that, they've Boy. had two matches on the Saudi Arabia shows yep. and closed the show at SummerSlam 2018. Yep. Really, their first match was their best, and everything. <laughs> a lot of people say this. Their very first match had no right of being that good only because Roman was the highly hated Roman. Like, nobody wanted him there. That match was good. That was easily still their best match. Them two going at it together, just singles competition, their best match they've ever had that many years ago. Everything else has since felt like a bit of a letdown at the end of the day. The Lesnar Reigns feud showed new signs of life with the Heyman drama and emergence of Cowboy Brock in late yeah. 2021, but by the time they stood across the ring at Mania for the third and hopefully final time, there was a sense that everyone would be happy if the pair of them never so much looked at each other again, let alone wrestled. Number one, yeah. Kane versus The Undertaker. When that big, big masked bastard <laughs> uh, the doors off Hell in a Cell and crazy the amount of matches on his head his own finishing move, you got the sense that the subsequent well, no, they, the yeah, they actually had was going to be something special. And it was in the beginning, as yeah, the two was. didn't meet until WrestleMania 14, a good six months after Kane's debut, with plenty of twists and turns thrown in along the way to keep Attitude Era fans hooked until the Supernatural Sibling Showdown. Even the post-WrestleMania Inferno match was intriguing, due in large part to the novelty of the stipulation, mm -hmm. but from there, it was a case of diminishing returns. They reignited the feud in 2000, which was short and naff, and then again in 2003 yep, to 2004 uh, yeah. in order to kill off Biker Taker and bring back the dead man. It was also rubbish, but nowhere near as rotten as their craptacular wet fart of a feud in 2010, <laughs> yeah. which saw them stink out the joint on three consecutive pay-per-views <laughs> until Kane buried his bro yep. again. Again. <sighs> I forgot he did bury The Undertaker twice. <laughs> How many times you gotta bury a nigga, bro? Yeah, man. <laughs> I can see how that would be the the, the number one <laughs> feud that extended a little bit too long, man. So comment down below. Let me know. Uh, which feud do you guys feel like overstayed its welcome? Let me know down below. Me, personally, I, I'm, I'm going to go with Brock, Roman, and John Cena, Randy Orton. There were some great matches between both those feuds, but I just feel like they kind of overstayed the welcome and you know you could have given those spots potentially to somebody else uh you know up a coming star so but appreciate all love and support road to 90k appreciate y'all kicking with me see y'all next one peace